be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Road Home Podcast with Ethan Nickturn. Join Ethan as he and his guests explore the Buddhist path as it relates to art, culture, activism, politics, Western psychology, and more. If you'd like to support Ethan's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Ethan. Hi everyone. This is Ethan Nickturn for the Road Home Podcast. I'm I'm happy to be joined today by my friend, who's also a writer in Hollywood and a Dharma practitioner, AJ Marichal. Um, so AJ, welcome to the Road Home Podcast. Thank you for having me, Ethan. So there's a couple of reasons I want to have you on for a conversation. The, the main reason was because you're you're a writer. You write. Um, it's not. Is it called fiction when you do it for the screen? I guess it's called fiction. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, uh, you know, one of my entries into screenwriting, one of the uh, hurdles was that I did not identify as a fiction writer. I really more worked in a nonfiction space. And so, you know, it is fiction that we are making things up or is I oftentimes when I'm in a writing process, I like to distinguish between telling story and just making something up. So let me be a little more specific. We are definitely telling stories that are in a fictional realm. Yes. Yeah. And the other the other part about us is which I wasn't initially thinking about talking about this at all um, and was actually a little hesitant to to even uh, have you on the podcast is we do work together uh, in the student teacher relationship. But you actually said that you want you thought that would be a cool thing to talk about, like what it's like to actually have a teacher working along the Buddhist path and, and what that relationship is like for you. So. I'm gung ho to talk about that with you. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's something that I've had people ask me, what does that mean? What is that relationship like? What do you talk about? And, uh, you know, you also have at times been essential for me navigating my spiritual path while working in this industry. You know, we've had sessions that are very specifically focused on how I'm showing up at work as a Dharma practitioner. So, um I think it's interesting and maybe somebody will get something out of that. Yeah. So maybe if we could hear a little bit more about your origin story, uh, how you got into meditation and Buddhism, and then also how you got into screenwriting, like how these two sides of you, uh, where they came from. Yeah. Uh, my origin story when it comes to uh, Buddhism is... I feel like it's sort of a cliche. It was like I was 22 and read some Pema Chodron and was like, oh, this is making sense. Um, <laughs> uh, but when I look back at my 20s, it really was um, a journey of stumbling toward the Dharma path, stumbling off of it, being like, you know, maybe I actually that's not as important as I thought it was, stumbling back toward it, off of it. And it was really, um, when I had a very formative death happen in my family, I lost a, a, a relative who was my age to terminal illness that I realized um, the way that my life was structured, I was trying to fit spirituality and the Dharma kind of into the open nooks and crannies that were available in my free time or in my bandwidth. And uh or sort of stacking it on top of other priorities. And I realized I needed to kind of invert that model. And I was like, spirituality is the ground upon which we lay everything else. Um, and so that was when I actually reached out to you for the first time and I'd read your books and, uh, I, I was I was shocked that we could develop a, a student teacher relationship, but along the way, I had been meditating since I was about meditating in earnest since I was about twenty three. So I have almost a decade of practice now under my belt, and um, yeah, I think anybody who's been practicing for a while can probably say life is better uh, when you're practicing less suffering, which to me right. is a form of better, uh, yeah. less needless. 
maybe not always more pleasant, but less, less, less suffering. Oh, self-awareness is a hell of a drug. <laughs> Sometimes it would be really nice to be less, less, less conscious. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I agree. Well, that's, that's the, I think that's both it, from the matrix. And that's also, I think there's a line from Bull Durham, uh, the the world is made for people who aren't cursed with self awareness. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's uh, it's it's been a a very important journey for me to be uh, settling into a commitment to a Dharma practice. You know, I took my refuge vows with you. Um, which was kind of interesting because I realized I was a little bit late to the game in terms of other people who were in our, our refuge vow ceremony. But, uh, you know, I'd been, I, one thing that I really appreciate about my Dharma practice is that I was really rattle testing it, if you will. Um, so, you know, something like, uh, studying karma was becoming really relevant to me because of experiences that I was having in the world. I was like, oh, this aspect of the Dharma is actually, feeling really applicable, um, or, you know, the idea of, I don't really want to say no self, but non-self as my identity started to change as a woman and whatnot. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's been a really nourishing journey in that, um, I came to the Dharma and it came to me in an organic way, an honest way. And I feel, uh, very happily committed to it now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so recently I had on the, I am always interested in writing process, obviously the creative expression process altogether, but specifically writing things that didn't actually happen, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the more fictional writing process. So recently had my friend, uh, you know, one, maybe one of the most famous Buddhist novelists right now, Ruth Ozeki on to talk mm-hmm. about. Uh, her new book and, and, but you're the first person, I think you're the first screenwriter who's been, been on the podcast. So how Mm -hmm. did you be, how did you become a screenwriter? Um, so, you know, as I said, I'd been writing a lot of nonfiction. I was working in journalism and whatnot, uh, but my nonfiction always had a creative bent to it in a really strong study of character. You know, I, I, I'm a really firm believer that the ultimate character study that you could be doing is journaling in writing. Um, the more that you come to know yourself and your own psyche and your own mental processes and bring a sort of radical honesty to the choices that you're making, uh, the better you'll be in your character work as a fiction writer um, because you're you're more attuned to the range of human choices and uh and also just the complexity of someone's inner world. And so there was a moment when I was, uh, I, I'm actually, the holiday season, this is the eight year anniversary of me writing my first script. So uh, glad to be celebrating it. And I was, I told a friend, no, I'm not going to write a script, but I need to be doing something more than, um, you know, kind of cranking things out as a reporter. And she kept saying, though, you should consider writing a pilot. And I was going to sleep one night. And uh, as somebody who loves to overthink, I was uh, doing the thing that maybe some listeners might relate to, which is running a scenario in my head over and over again in an at times turbulent uh, romantic situation I was in where I was like, oh, we're going to be in this room and I'm going to say this and then he's going to say that and then I'm going to say this back. And it just kind of hit me. I think I'm writing a scene. <laughs> And, and so it was sort of the, you know, I'd, I'd been meditating a little bit at that point. And it it was really this uh, light bulb that went on above me where I realized, oh, so I have the mental process of creating a scene down in my head. I'm doing it every night, really. So what if I applied this to different content, to a different idea, to characters that maybe are more fictional instead of people from my life. And, uh, and so from there, I, uh, I took an idea that I had for a book and I converted it into a script. And, um, I, my, my journey of learning how to write a script was really just reading a few scripts and then trying to translate the voice that I had in a nonfiction medium from prose essays and lyric essays over into something like a TV pilot. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was uh, it was challenging at first. My mom read my per, uh, about half of my first pilot, and she said, "Well, sweetie, you don't need to put everything in capital letters." 
<laughs> that's a thing in a script. If you're, I mean, that's an interesting there. reader to have your mom, right? <laughs> yeah. My mom has a writing background and she is still to this day, my first read on everything. She is, um, wow, I didn't even know that. Yeah. She is, uh, a safe space for me and also has seen me write for my whole life. So she understands my voice in a way where, even if she sees that I'm missing the mark of what I'm trying to do, she understands my intention on the page usually. Um, so, and she's also a quick read, which I appreciate. You know, sometimes you send you send a project to somebody and you don't hear back for three weeks and uh, takes you to a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful to have that kind of relationship with my mom. She does. She reads. She reads everything. So. So what's, what's the process like of entering like Hollywood? You know, like, I think that's something a lot of people don't know. Like, so you, you actually pitch something like, how does this, how does this work that you can go from like, I want to write, I've been writing screens in my head, which is basically what a lot of meditation practice is, right. Uh, Writing scenes in my head. Then I turn that into a pilot or something. And then how, how do you, how do you get that in front of somebody? And then they say, sure, sure, kid, we'll give you a job, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So at the time I was already working in the industry as a reporter at an entertainment trade called Variety. So I was kind of immersed in it a little bit, but it was important for me to not be leaning on those professional connections to be circulating this new creative material, my first script. So um, I went through two personal connections that I had with people who worked at um, an agency or a management company. And so usually your first step would be seeking representation. And that's going to be, you know, your, your entry point to all of the executives and decision makers who would be reading your material and considering you for jobs. So once I had representation in my corner, you know, they saw something in that script, they saw a voice um, and potential. Uh, I started go, being sent out for what are called general meetings. I had a few this week, which is kind of a meet and greet with executives who appreciate what you've been doing on the page. They want to get to understand your story and your interests more. And then there are jobs in the TV industry where you would be going up for a writer's room to you know, fly under a showrunner, a head writer to help see their vision through for a TV show. Most TV shows on the air do have a writer's room. So a team of maybe four to 10 writers, for example, um, who are seeing a vision through. Uh, It's not very common for a TV show to be written by just one writer, but that does happen. That's sometimes a more uh, British model, if you will. Downton Abbey was written by one writer. Wow. Um, the first season of True Detective was written by one writer. Uh, some limited series are written by one writer. Devs on FX is a good example. Um, but it's a beast because in a feature, you're going to be putting down 90 to 100 pages in a TV series, even just 10 episodes, you're looking at about 600 pages, you know? And so having a team around you to identify blind spots, bring more uh, diverse experience to the storytelling and to the page, um, and to be able to push the story in more progressive, nuanced direction is really important. So uh, so there are those jobs. And then there is development, which is you uh, creating the vision for a show on your own. Yeah. So, so that, that collaborative process that you're talking about, right. So for some parts of the process feel very similar, like, you know, getting an agent, that's pretty much the same thing as you would do in the literary or book writing world. Um, And so you have to collaborate with that person on your vision, on, on what your voice is, on, you know, who you're trying to reach or where, where they think you fit into the, the, the market which is our kind of crappy capitalist way of saying like this, this world, et cetera. Um, But so like, I, I have to say like, I, I don't mind working with an editor, like especially a great editor, like the editor I'm working on my fifth book. Um, The editor who worked with me uh, on the road home is the favorite editorial experience Mm -hmm. uh, I've ever had. Gabriella Dube. And um 
but it's never fun to collaborate with other people. So, so the idea of like, we're going to write a season of something and there's going to, so how many writers are in a writer's room? Like, like, let's, let's say like, take the season of like Ted Lasso, which I wanted to talk to you about the phenomenon yeah. of Ted Lasso. Um, like how many writers write a season of Ted Lasso? Uh, I think that that writer's room has maybe six writers or so. Um, and they have an interesting situation where there are writers in the room who are also cast on the show. So Jason Sudeikis, and I believe his name is Brett Goldstein, who plays, um, oh God, I'm forgetting his name right now. The really gruff guy. Um, Roy oh, oh, Roy Kent, Roy Kent. Yeah, Roy Kent. Yeah. He's in the writer's room. Jason's in the writer's room. So that that that's an interesting situation where people that you're writing for are actually pitching in the room with you. Um, so, you know, as I was saying, it could be anything from, you know, a small room of about three or four writers to uh, comedy rooms, broadcast comedy rooms can be kind of big. I've been in rooms with 10 to 12 people and, you know, that's kind of intense in terms of uh, trying to get a pitch in or um, sometimes you can fall through the cracks in those rooms. Uh, but there is absolutely a psychology to the writer's room to understanding how the story is moving in the group conversation, what to advocate for, like what is the hill that you're going to die on when it comes to this pitch or this episode, um, learning when to wave the white flag and see that your showrunner, who's really you're supposed to be seeing their vision through, that is the goal at the end of the day is you are there for their vision. Uh, when you just need to sort of pack that idea in and go along with what the room is doing, um, there is a there is a lot of um, inner reflection that happens when you're in that that process. And something that you and I really were working on when I was in certain rooms was write speech uh, because a writer's room is essentially talking for six to eight hours a day. And often talking, if you're in a, a I would say a drama room, especially about fraught topics, uh, with people who maybe you wouldn't be talking about these topics with on an everyday basis. Um, it can, uh, sometimes the way I describe it is, uh, you know, a tough day in a writer's room can be like the longest Thanksgiving dinner, uncomfortable family dinner of your life. Uh, so you really, you really learn how to hold your seat and um, be uh, thoughtful about how you're using language in that moment, when you're speaking, when you're not speaking, what is the purpose of your speech? Uh, who needs to be heard in the room at that moment? Who needs to be supported? Um, and also trying to avoid idle chatter, which can happen in a writer's room a lot, yes. you know, where you're just trying to pass the time and sometimes gossip can start happening. Uh, so I find that right speech isn't just important uh, in this industry on the page. It's also really important in terms of how you're showing up in a writer's room. And, and also that you, I mean, that it just sounds, I mean, it's, 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 it sounds like it can go wrong in, in a lot of different ways and have a lot of different, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of different places where the teachings of Sangha or community like right speech become really important because there's so many personalities, but it, to me, it just, it just sounds like a miracle that it, like, if I was writing a book, like I'm working on it my book right now. And I was like, okay, AJ, you're going to write chapter four, but I'll give you input. Okay. Like Bill, you're going to write chapter five. Okay. You write <laughs> like the idea that that would create a coherent book that I would be happy with feels so foreign to me, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like it requires so much trust and letting go to do things that way. And maybe that's why when TV shows feel like they go in a weird direction in a certain right. episode or something like that. Maybe that's part of that phenomenon. Well, I, uh, you know, if we were to have a writer's room around your next book, which we could totally do, Ethan. Yeah, you uh, could you could be part of my writer's room. The most essential part of a good writer's room and a strong writer's room is a showrunner with a strong vision. You have to know what you're pitching toward in a writer's room. Uh, and so the stronger that a showrunner's vision is, and sometimes a strong vision can be executed in a rather dysfunctional way in a room, but there are times when I'm like, I would prefer a little bit of a 
dysfunctional execution over no vision whatsoever. If a showrunner really knows what they want and they've hired a team of writers to be pitching toward what they want, and that showrunner is saying no, no, no to that idea, yes to that idea, then I know the idea that got a yes. I can look at it and say, what did he or she like about that idea? Mm -hmm. And how do we continue to pitch toward that? You know, Um, let's say that they liked something, uh, what we would say is soapy. There was some sort of relationship twist in it uh, that was a little bit off center. So I can understand that's something that the showrunner wants for this show. That's part of their vision. Let's keep pitching toward that. Um, Because a writer's room is not about showing up and pitching what you want to be watching, really that factors into how you're talking about story, but it really is about what is for the good of the show, what is for the good of the showrunner's vision, and at times, do I need to sidebar or push back against my showrunner's vision a little bit for the good of the show? Um, Mm -hmm. But there is a sort of uh, uh, workhorse and a little bit of a selfless quality to sitting in a writer's room and uh, realizing that it's not just about you and your ideas. You have to be humble. You have to be willing to compromise and also learn when to be quiet for a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you talk about practicing right speech and bringing Dharma principles, right, into that work. I mean, obviously, like every world has its issues, right? We We could talk about, you know, obviously the the difficulties of being in the political world or, you know, all my friends who work in academia talk about how political and fraught that world is, or, you know, I I can tell anyone who wants to hear about the subtle and not so subtle aspects of, you know, the, the economies of the spiritual world, but, you know, working in Hollywood, it's the the reputation is just a lot of ego, a lot of, you know, one-upsmanship trying to be the biggest person. So, how do you create like an actual sangha out of out of that? Do people share those? Like when you enter a writer's room, is there a sense of like, we're all in this together? Let's all try to practice right speech? Because I could see there's so many dynamics, especially as a young woman being in that space yeah. that make it hard. I, I think that we're at a turning point in our writer's room culture. Uh I would say that maybe our Zoom room culture is factoring into it as well. But After the Me Too movement, or I guess that you could say during it, since I'm not sure that it ever will entirely end. Yeah, I think it's still moving. Yeah, (laughs) we're we're, we're, we're still in the hashtag. Um, There has been an unprecedented call for accountability in terms of how you are showing up in this industry. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a lot of the behaviors that were seen as okay, um, and if not okay, like that's not okay. At least a lot of executives and producers were willing to turn a blind eye and say, that's just how that showrunner is. That's just how that creative is. We just all need to deal with it so that they can get the product out the door. There are conversations after, you know, massive exposés in the LA Times or Hollywood Reporter or the New York Times and whatnot of maybe it doesn't need to be like this. And it doesn't even need to be sexual harassment or sexual assault. Um, or, uh, you know, very explicit racial discrimination and whatnot um, for there to be conversations of, do we need to be in these toxic environments uh, anymore? This is, these are conversations that are happening on, you know, the set of TV shows and movies as well of, there has to be another way. There has to be a version of existing in this industry where you are not showing up and feeling emotionally and spiritually depleted by the end of the day. And so there are, uh, in in writer's rooms, there are screenwriters that will ask, how does that showrunner feel about the emotional quality of the room? Do they want to spend time with their family at the end of the day? Uh, Are they kind? Um, Do they have integrity with their writers? Um, Reputation really, really matters, especially in TV, because you're getting into these longer term relationships with people and you're having to work together. So uh, for me, when I have thought to myself, uh, you know, I've I've been in some some challenging work environments, uh, you know, when I thought like, how how would I want to run a room or when I am given more power, how would I want to leverage it? 
uh, making sure that people feel taken care of, that their needs matter, that they're heard, and that they're in an emotionally safe work environment is really important to me. So I feel like we're at that point where those conversations are happening, and we're probably starting to see changes in these environments in part because of the exposés that have been happening. I think it's, you know, lit a real fire under people uh, to know that there is accountability and there are consequences out there if you are abusive or creating a toxic work environment. Yeah. So can we talk about writing characters? Yeah. And writing writing character dynamics? Mm -hmm. Like, this is the interesting thing because, like... How do you write characters from a dharmic perspective? It, or is that even, and this is where I think the Ted Lasso conversation, I wanted to take this, you know, my thought, and we had an earlier conversation about maybe doing this podcast is like, so much of what is written, you know, on on your Hulus or HBOs or Netflix, it, whether it's comedy or it's um, drama, feels like it's what I would call to use Sanskrit. It's like a celebration of Klesha. It's like you show neurotic stuck care. You show people kind of behaving at their worst. You know, even if somebody seems d- decent, there's usually a reveal that on upon which the drama is based that actually they, they had much worse aims in mind than you thought. Like, you know, all of these backs, you know, succession, all of these different like kind of backstabbing or, um, you know, I'm even thinking of like White White Lotus, which I thought did a really good job of painting the the complexity. But there's still this sense of like people are inherently selfish and stuck, and we're going to show that to you at interesting angles. But it's not a very. Do you agree that it's often not a very hopeful vision of human nature that a lot of what shows give to us? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that each show is espousing a certain worldview, and that could in part be due to the taste of the writer, the taste of the network, the sort of sense of what is on trend right now in TV. You know, the the, the male anti-hero starting with Tony Soprano was a really compelling type of character that has kind of burned itself out a bit, um, partly likely because of what we were experiencing with the Trump administration and whatnot, you know, art is reflecting culture is reflecting art um, or rather art, art is reflecting our uh, political culture and our social culture is reflecting art. Um, but I, I was thinking about this idea uh, on, on a meeting yesterday, actually, of, you know, a, a show that depicts badness. Uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to come up with twists and character turns and surprising reveals if the worldview is people are going to be bad and duplicitous and hiding things from one another, you know? Uh, So it's really easy to create stakes when dramatic bad things are happening. It's actually quite challenging to create stakes and compelling story that has a real engine behind it when people are trying to, quote, do good. Yeah. Uh, even though I actually think as both a Dharma practitioner and a writer, that that's far more complex to uh, live by and write by. I had a showrunner one time say that one of the hardest things to depict is friendship in a TV series. Yeah. Is how do you keep that dynamic and alive and whatnot? It's a lot easier to depict, say, an affair. You know, uh, somebody in a marriage is stepping out and, uh, you know, lying to their spouse. And there are all these twists and turns and whatnot, as opposed to showing the evolution of a friendship. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, Sometimes depicting badness, if you will, that's a very reductive way of describing it, um, but sort of uh, depicting amorality uh, can be the the lower hanging fruit of your character choices. Um, And what's interesting about some shows is that showrunners will say like, on our show, this character will never make this choice. Or this character will always be trying to strive for this value, 
you know? And that's an interesting creative challenge to be facing. What happens when in your show, we actually are trying to have people uh, making more ethical choices? There's a lot of friction that can come up with that. The same level of friction, I think, is people making more amoral choices. Mm. Um, and that's not, uh, you know, to, to say that I'm in any way the moral compass of TV, but when you're in a writer's room or when you're thinking about, um, how, you know, you're, you're, you're getting a note, you're on deadline. And sometimes the note is that it doesn't feel like there are stakes here. What's happening. What's interesting. What's the conflict? You know, that is always the question. What is the conflict? And it's really easy to create conflict if you have people, you know, lying to one another and making yeah. difficult choices. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm working, been working on a novel for a while, which is more a labor of love, but like that is about a group of friends over, you know, written in three parts over 22 years from 1998 to 2020 who uh, have a falling out. And then as, you know, grown up people in their forties have a, have a resolution, you know, and mm -hmm. it's interesting because the stakes are, I wonder if the stakes are enough in the sense of, it's really just about the normal ways people fall out and then come back together, or at least understand each other late, later on um, in some that, kind well, of... That's, that's one of the beauties about the novel is that it uh, it allows for that type of slow burn development of relationships and whatnot. Right. Um, you know, I'm taking out a project right now that is very rooted in friendship. And there is the sense of having to heighten the choices that everyone's making, uh, heighten the moments where somebody might have at least been perceived as backstabbing and whatnot. And that's because the medium is calling for more propulsion. You have to get someone past that commercial break. You have to get them to tune into the next episode, or even you have to get them to keep subscribing to one of these streaming platforms. So uh, the the need for that conflict-driven, stakes-driven engine in something like TV uh, calls for a different type of writing on friendship and whatnot than, say, the novel might be uh, offering. Right. Do you have, AJ, do you have a favorite character that you've written or favorite character dynamic? Like, is there one in your writing for television that you say, like, I really liked this one from either from a dharmic perspective or just from a personal taste perspective? Is there some character for you that stood out? Uh, something that I've written on my, for my own spec work or on a, on a TV show? Either. Either. Um, one answer off the top of my head is kind of weird. Uh, I wrote a pilot. Uh, it's an original sample. I still sometimes take meetings off of it where I wanted to do a, a character study of a female sociopath. Um, and this was because I had been reading some nonfiction literature about what being a sociopath in our society actually means. The idea that uh, there's a sociopathic spectrum and that a lot of the qualities that are pedestaled in our culture uh, are actually traits that are exhibited by people who um, could be diagnosed as sociopaths. And so I, I was like, why is it that in our TV and film culture, whenever we see a sociopath, they're usually dropping bodies in the pilot or they're dropping bodies in the movie. When the reality is there's a higher rate of sociopathy in our politics, among doctors, bankers, stockbrokers, and whatnot because of these personality characteristics that allow them to be really good at these jobs that we hold in high esteem in our nation. And so I wrote this pilot about a uh, female sociopath who works, who leads a nonprofit organization. And it really was about um, both wanting this woman in your corner and being seduced by what she's bringing to the table and also being sort of frightened of her and pushing her away. And, uh, and the characters around her, both not understanding her and she's also not understanding their choices. One thing that interested me in my research was certain sociopaths on these anonymous message boards saying, I don't understand the idea of, quote, killing out of passion. What does that mean? So these people that experience empathy can just do something from an emotion and it's justifiable and they'll get away with it. What is that? And so it was an interesting character study because it required me to bring empathy to somebody who has a completely different psychological reality than me. 
and to consider how we all might be on a spectrum like this to a certain extent. Our own ability to experience guilt or empathy, uh, you know, might be shifting every day. And so I really enjoyed writing that character. Uh, it challenged me as a young writer. And I and I wanted to write something that might make you, when you finish the piece, uh, look at yourself and your relationships in a slightly different, more curious light. Mm. So, yeah, so there is, I mean... It's interesting because I've been like following like Dan Harris and the 10% Happier. Uh, They've been talking about Ted Lasso a lot, you know, like, like a lot, a lot. And um, there's a, I like that show. Um, Seems like everybody, every, like everybody has a crush on Jason Sudeikis, which is a thing I didn't know. Like uh, apparently Brett. Yeah. What's that? (laughs) Or, or Brett Goldstein, apparently. Oh yeah. 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 but uh, yeah, so so I think Jason Sudeikis said when he was on Saturday Night Live, he said, we were all surprised that this show succeeded because it's about two things. Americans can't stand kindness and soccer, mm-hmm. which isn't ex- the second one, I think, is not quite true because I think uh, 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 European soccer is becoming more and more popular in, in the United States. But yeah, um, I feel like I have several friends who are waking up at very odd hours, like 4 a.m., and just screaming from their living room because some, <laughs> some soccer game is on. Yeah, that's been a weird like side fetish for me in the in the pandemic is getting more into your I would always watch the World Cup, but actually getting more into like the club soccer. But um it does, I mean, it's not, it is from a basic goodness perspective, right? So it is about people who are actually trying to do their best rather than there being some reveal of like, no, this person's actually evil or this person's actually just greedy, et cetera. It's like, it's about when you reveal more and more about the person, it's actually, there's this view that at the core of people is basic goodness, right? So that, so it's, it's, it's not a basic badness perspective on the world, but I think I love that show. Cause I think they, they're managing to do it without it being like, um, you know, it's not like Mickey mouse. It's not like the show has no edge to it. So yeah, I just do you do you watch Ted Lasso? Do you like it? I do watch Ted Lasso and I do like it. Are we allowed to talk about it in a way that uh, has spoilers because obviously in the second Let's just let's put in kind of let's put in that. yeah, let's put in a spoiler alert for everybody who who has not watched maybe through that through the end of the second season. Is that what you're going right. to talk about? I mean I mean they should be caught up, but yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, listen to the rest of this podcast. Uh, although we're going to come back in ten minutes may- or five minutes, maybe talk for five minutes about the student-teacher relationship. For so, for the next few minutes, just uh, spoiler alert: end of second season of Ted Lasso. Information. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so I was in a meeting yesterday, and we were discussing Ted Lasso actually, and and we really were talking about shows that feel good to watch. And she was describing them. She said, you know, a show like This Is Us, I was describing as a, quote, guilty pleasure. And I was like, it's really interesting that we have to couch watching a show that feels good as a guilty pleasure. Um, That there's some sort of uh, uh, implied intellectual inferiority to that kind of content that it's not pushing us to, you know, think in a, in, in, in more complex, AKA dark ways. Uh, And so Ted Lasso has been really interesting uh, in part because I I think it's a very well-written show, but also the discourse that it created online. Every so often I would go over to twitter.com. I don't have an account anymore. And Ethan, I respect that you just stay in those trenches. (laughs) I don't know how you do it. I'm like, you have like, you've reached a level in your meditation practice. (laughs) I was like, I got to get out. Um, But I will go. It's definitely World War I trenches. That's a good, I mean, it's World War III. I've seen you in those comments, Ethan. I've seen you in those comments. Like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll engage. Um, um, but so, uh, I was, I was like, damn, the Ted Lasso discourse is brutal out there for season two. And I was like, why is it that people are very uncomfortable or feel that they need to justify watching something that makes them feel all right? Um, and so let me frame this with, there is a conversation to be had about who gets to have an aspirational worldview, uh, and, 
at the end of the day, our lead Ted Lasso, Jason Sudeikis, is a straight white guy from the Midwest. One can argue he has not had the type of friction in life that might collapse a uh, a sort of really uplifting worldview. Although in season two, we start to realize that that worldview of do right, do everything, believe was kind of a reaction to trauma that he endured in his coping strategy. It's a coping strategy. And so I think that the success of the second season, and a lot of people have opinions about the second season, is that they took the Ted Lasso very sincere, naive, earnest worldview about people doing right by each other. And they started really rattle testing it. They started having it break down for Ted. They started exploring, uh, you know, how that actually might set the the soccer team back, how it might actually hinder our, our players from getting the healing that they need. You know, you bring on this therapist character who's like, it doesn't need to be just tapping that big believe poster and getting out on the field. Um, so I thought that what was really interesting was that they took uh, a first season where it really was about basic goodness and, uh, and in the second season started to look at how that can break down while still maintaining a worldview that these characters are going to try to do right by each other. Um, and that's that's an interesting edict to have in a writer's room because they're often, again, in order to create stakes and conflict, there is that uh, tendency to go for the dark manipulation bucket. And they really funneled a lot of that into Nate in a slow burn way that I thought was really interesting while allowing the other characters to still see the good in one another. Um, but yeah, I have a I have a joke with a friend where you know, we were like, what TV universe do you think you're living in? And then encountering somebody who's living in a very different universe. And uh, we were discussing a dating situation that she was in. And she was like, she's like, it's like, I'm out here thinking I'm in Ted Lasso and he's in Game of Thrones, <laughs> you know, but it, it's a worldview question. It's what do you think people are capable of? Are people, you know, showing up in basically good ways? Are they trying to be kind to one another? Is that, is that something worth striving toward? Or are we you know, being driven by, as you said, our clashes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I've been avoiding a little bit because this topic uh, maybe makes me uncomfortable to talk too much about publicly, not to talk about publicly, but to talk about with somebody I, I work with as a, as a personal student. But um, yeah, I mean, I think this is the, the, the question of like having a teacher or as I, you know, the, the word that comes from Sanskrit, Kalyana Mitra, which means spiritual friend or kind of mentor along the path. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when people talk about having a spiritual teacher or a Buddhist teacher, they're, they're either talking about, you know, a guru, which is a totally different kind right. of um, devotional um, relationship that often includes a lot of, um, a lot of beauty, I would say, and also can include a lot of projection, a lot of transferences, counter transferences that, that there needs to be a lot of awareness. But when you do have a guru, it's it's usually not somebody, you know, very well, uh, personally. And then a lot of times when people, uh, say they have a teacher, um, it's not somebody who's actually their teacher. It's somebody who they've been, they've been inspired by their, it's somebody they've, they've received instructions from, or they've been inspired by their teachings. Right. So mm -hmm. I sort of always have this guideline for people that if you're going to call someone your teacher, you need to be in some sort of actual relationship with them. So mm -hmm. I've always said, if somebody doesn't know they're your teacher, then they're not your teacher. You could say, I love their teachings or ex Sounds whatever like you want to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it is. It is a little bit like they calling someone. They're, they're in a relationship they, with yeah, you. They, <laughs> they, yeah, exactly. It's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people call people call people their teacher who they've never even been on a date with. You know, it's even. It's, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, you know, but we do meet once a month to talk about, uh, you know, I mean, we, we talk about... Uh, practice right meditation practice and then we talk about trying to be sort of a, a a practitioner in the world you know so this notion of like right speech in a writer's room in hollywood you know or, or how to handle livelihood or how to handle relationships these are conversations that that we have so what what i mean what is that like you don't have to get too far into it but you did want to talk about this like what is that like for you 
I I find it's very grounding and additive and nourishing. Um, again, I've I've taken not just a refuge vow, but a, a vow personally, just a really deep personal vow to prioritize my spiritual practice in my life. And to me, working with a teacher with you gives me a level of accountability and insight that I wouldn't have if I was kind of drifting on my own, you know, maybe going to some sanghas and whatnot. But that that uh, that relationship with somebody who starts to know me over a period of time and understand my practice and my habits over a period of time, uh, I find to be really beneficial because sometimes you have questions uh, or concerns that uh, require somebody to actually know you um, that can't be answered by just reading a sort of general Dharma text or raising your hand in Sangha at the end of a sit. Um, And so I've really come to appreciate that. Uh, I was thinking about some of the best insight that you've offered me over the years. And it's two things. One is that practicing in the moment, on the moment, on the spot is the hardest part. Uh, So often encouraging me to go easy on myself, which leads into the second best insight, or maybe the first really, which was you're doing fine. (laughs) Um, And, uh, you know, I think that maybe some people might confuse, especially a, a, a Dharma teacher relationship with something that I'm sure you've experienced this of it having to be sort of a borderline therapy type relationship and whatnot. Um, And I think it's important to understand what you're showing up for, you know, this relationship seeking, because that's not like, you know, that's not your job to be my therapist or anything like that. Um, It's, it's much more about guiding how I can be working with my mind and framing a lot of worldly events and personal events through a Dharma perspective. Yeah. Um, and that just keeps me rooted in my practice and it keeps me accountable. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of gentle nudges that you offer me, uh, yeah. which I always appreciate. Yeah, that is that is a question I get a lot when I'm working, you know, with people one on one. And I typically meet with people I work with one on one once a month. How is this different from therapy? You know, and th- I mean, you know, in some ways, whenever you're holding space for somebody, you could to use an overused phrase, you're you're receiving that you're you're doing some, you're in the ballpark of the same thing, you know. And I've had, you know, yoga teacher friends say, like, you know, when they would teach a private yoga session, that there was a feeling of like it's almost like a type of therapy. You know, therapy just means healing. But I think this notion of the the Kalyana Mitra or the spiritual mentor, it's somebody you check in with, somebody you share the path with. Um, it's also, I think the important part is that you have to be doing your own practice, right? So, so a therapist is sometimes somebody you go to because there's some acute issue happening in your life. Like let's say, you know, a heightened anxiety or, you know, there's some specific um, issue that a person has um, whereas I think of a, you know, Kalyana Mitra is more of a like ongoing guide. And, you know, I do think there's some crossover, like from Western psychology, <clears throat> the the humanist Carl Rogers, his his notion that the, the therapist's job is to hold the person they're working with in unconditional positive regard. That is the piece from Western psychology. I mean, there's a lot of pieces from Western psychology, but that's definitely the piece that I take as like, this is somebody sharing the path. It's somebody who maybe has been doing this longer, has good skills, good boundaries, you know, but also maybe can share, you know, where their struggles have been, especially as we're trying to build this template for being a worldly practitioner, you know, like, um, you know, I've had people on, on my podcast who've done very deep retreat practice, but like, you know, these are the kinds of conversations I have with students. It's like, okay, I'm going to do my practice. I'm going to go on retreat. Then I'm going to enter a writer's room in Hollywood. Like there's no sutra that talks about that, you know? So we also have to work out together like, oh, this is my experience, you know, being in the world and, you know, trying to be a spiritual person or trying to be a creative person and, and how to practice with that. So. um, Yeah. I I think that I, you know, One of the great things is that you can also offer that 30,000 foot view that I think is essential when you're working with your mind, because there are a lot of times when you, you know, 
a, a student could be showing up for a session and it's literally you're talking about what it's like to sit with your mind for long stretches and observe your thoughts. Like you can get mm. tangled up in there. And there have been times when some of your best insights would just be like, sounds like dating or you're doing <laughs> fine or, you know, like, and uh, it's, it's, those are really helpful because you're helping uh both encourage me or any student to work deeply with their mind while also keeping a light perspective. Um, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I've really appreciated a commentary in recent years that encourage people to understand that a meditation practice and a Dharma practice um, can complement and be additive toward a mental health journey, but oftentimes is not uh, sufficient. It's it's not it's not the only thing. It cannot replace, say, trauma oriented therapy. Yes, and whatnot. And I think that that is something where, you know, probably in my twenties, I at times thought like, well, meditation will save the day. Um, or like if I read this Dharma text, that'll save the day. And there were moments when I had to realize like, no, I actually need a different for a different modality to help me through this. And that doesn't mean that my Dharma practice is any less relevant it means that there are other resources out there, um, that I can turn to, uh, to help me with my mind. And that's yeah. been it for me. I mean, I think the Dharma that, that, and, and having the approach of a meditator, the, the basic perspective is that you begin to draw out your own wisdom. You begin to develop your own self-awareness, which is going to be where all the insights into what direction to go in, uh, how to tackle life's issues. It is going to come from deepening that field of awareness. But yeah, tra tra I mean, there's been a lot of good work done in, in terms of trauma-informed meditation, et cetera. The issue with trauma specifically, and, you know, there's really good Western psychological modalities to work with trauma, EMDR, somatic experiencing, et cetera. The issue with trauma for the meditator is it literally creates a space that awareness cannot go. So, so meditation cannot really, the, the basic premise of meditation that you can know what is happening in the mind, which is the basic premise of mindfulness can't really operate in a situation where somebody's been traumatized because they've been flooded basically through a survival instinct into right. a space of non-awareness, right? And that has to be, that can't be self-addressed, right? Mm -hmm. Meditation is a great, it's a great practice for the things that can be unveiled with self-awareness, which is is a lot for a lot of us, you know, that we we actually learn to trust our own intelligence. And as a teacher, I feel like, you know, especially when I'm working with, uh, you know, really smart people like yourself who have a lot of uh, wisdom beyond their years, if I may say. Um, and now I sound like the old man because I'm about <laughs> 10 years older than you. Um, I that. That'll be me emailing you after like, wow, Ethan, I've really been thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you just try to reflect back to them like, you, your insights in a session are like, so what are you noticing about yourself? And then the only time you really kind of hold their feet to the fire is when somebody's going against their own insight, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it's really useful, but, but there are, we do need other relational formats to work with the parts of our mind where self-awareness cannot operate, cannot be uncovered just through a meditative or contemplative process. Yeah. My last, I guess, thought on that is I've noticed, you know, having worked a practice for a while now, um, that there were less skillful parts of me that would kind of co-opt my Dharma practice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something like, uh, I think that working with desire or having needs, say in a relationship or something, uh, if you have a tendency or something you're working with to potentially suppress those things, uh, or if you have a tendency to say isolate or to intellectualize and whatnot, your mind could end up turning your Dharma practice into just the latest expression of that. And so that was a really humbling turn for me as a practitioner to look at, like, am I actually using my Dharma practice to reduce suffering in my life? Or are these patterns now finding these like, much more nuanced expressions through how I'm approaching sitting, how I'm approaching Sangha and whatnot. Um, 
So, you know, always trying to shine the light of awareness on everything. And that's something that I also appreciated uh, that you would offer me was that sometimes sitting is not the best choice in your practice. Sometimes it is about song. It's about community. You need to connect with people. Um, and so understanding that a, a, a practice can have balance um, and not be so all or nothing and rigid uh, has been very helpful. And I think that that comes from that sustained relationship with somebody. Okay. Well, AJ Marichelle, um, yeah, the, the Dharma of screenwriting. Uh, I think that's what we're going to call this podcast, if that's okay. Cool. Um, how, how can people find you online? I'm kind of offline right now. All right. Blessedly. <laughs> Good. You can only find her through my podcast. Um, well, uh, you're, the, you're the first person I uh, had on who isn't trying to promote anything, which is great because that's what podcasts are. So Yeah, it's just awesome. nice to talk about things that matter to me <laughs> and to you and to hopefully others. <laughs> okay, AJ Marichelle, uh, so great to talk to you. And um, I hope this has been interesting to everyone listening. It's been really interesting for me. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for listening and, uh, for the road home podcast, this is Ethan Nickturn and we will see you next time. 